So hi, I want to welcome you to Postgres vs. MongoDB for real-time machine learning on wind turbine data, where our speaker will discuss why Turbit Systems chose Postgres over MongoDB to capture and analyze wind turbine data in real time, and how they run machine learning on Postgres at scale. My name is Lindsay Hooper, and I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. I'm here with Luis Carril, product owner at Swarm64, and Michael Tichtmeyer, CEO and founder at Turbit Systems. I want to give you a little background on each. So Luis has developed Swarm64's Postgres-based analytics solution for several years and now helps to solve client problems and incorporate them into the Swarm64 technology. Previously, he worked for several universities and research centers in software engineering, cloud, parallelism, and high-performance computing. And Michael, prior to founding Turbit Systems, Michael conducted data science research at the Free University of Berlin, concentrating on the application of machine learning and data science, laser physics, and wind turbine measurements. He founded Turbit Systems based on this research. Um, so that's it for me. I'm going to hand it off to Luis and Michael. Y'all can take it away. So what are, what are we going to do today? Um, first, I will give you an introduction about um, what Turbid Systems is doing and why we use machine learning to analyze uh, wind turbine data. And then um, I will also give some thoughts and, and insights about our database and uh, why we first used Mongo and now are switching to Postgres. And I will give you some insights and wind turbine data and, and into the market, what, what the, how the market behaves and why um yeah it, it's a very special market and i think you're going to find some interesting insights there and then in the end lewis will talk a little bit more about uh, swarm 64 which is, is just an uh, awesome data uh, base company that's accelerating postgres and uh, we are using that currently and in the end uh, we will have some q a so machine learning for wind energy um First, to give you the insight, uh, wind, the wind industry is growing. We have more than 350 turbines, 350,000 turbines um, globally installed, and um, also more than 650,000 megawatts uh, in installed capacity. And we all know that because of climate change, we somehow need to uh, ensure that wind energy stays competitive because um, I think, and many other people believe that this is a good alternative. And in order to ensure that, we need to think of, of about um, how to reduce costs. And um, yeah, so um, to look a little bit more into the cost structure of um, wind energy, here on the right, you can see different sources of, um, of, of energy. Uh, right at the right, uh, offshore wind, biomass, then photovoltaic um, or solar, then nuclear power, um, coal, and then onshore wind and uh, water, um, uh, water power. And you can see that um, onshore wind energy, so the height is the cost in US dollar per megawatt hour. And you can see that the cost of wind energy is actually already quite low which doesn't mean that we need to put it lower. And especially if we want to go into a regime where um, wind energy is not subsidized any longer in, uh, uh, by the state or by, by other um, forms of subsidize, subsidization. Um, yeah, so let us look a little bit into the lifetime of a turbine. So we have, um, usually in Germany or mainly the, the, the manufacturers produce turbines that have to last 20 or sometimes 25 years. And during that lifetime, um, the, the failure rate is changing. So in the beginning of the, of, the, of the lifetime of a turbine, when the turbine is installed on the site, you have early failures because everything is new. Maybe it's a new turbine model and um, Maybe you need to um, install different uh, operating uh, management due to bad control uh, or other animals that are around. And all these um, 
yeah, typical uh, stuff um, 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 ends up in, in a higher failure rate, uh, let's say three years in the beginning. And then after a while, the turbine should run for the next 15 years, um, hopefully in a, in a good way and nothing breaks down. And um, sometimes you have a gearbox failure, you have a really severe failure um, that you, of course, want to prevent. And then after 20 years, this is actually a pretty interesting time because the turbine is not manufactured to uh, live longer than 20 years, but you theoretically can um, operate the turbine longer than that. And in this wear out time, of course, you have more failures coming up because um, just some parts break apart. And, um, but if you manage to, to, to have the turbine running in that last period, that's actually quite valuable um, in terms of um, the financial uh, perspective. So, um, and of course, in, in all three stages, we want to reduce the, the, um, the failure rates. <clears throat> so here I have a study from the Fraun German Fraunhofer Institute to give you a little overview about um, what failures can happen uh, in a turbine. And here you see in red on the left side, you see the uh, frequency of, um, of a failure in a typ typical component. So here you see the components. And then in blue on the right side, you see the time um, of, the, so you see the, the downtime for this particular failure, the average downtime. So uh, just to give you the names, so this is electrical component, then uh, electrical operation, the sensors, the hydraulics, the yaw system, the yaw, yaw motors, then the rotor blades, then the me mechanical brakes, um, the connection between the blades and the, the nacelle, the gearbox, the generator, and um, the nacelle and um, the drivetrain. And what is remarkable is that you have maybe here a very high rate of failures for electrical comp components, but where, like, what costs the most? That's the question. So if you, for instance, have a gearbox failure, it might not happen very often, but the downtime is quite high. So you have like six days of downtime here in this example. And um, that means that the turbine is not producing energy for six days. And if you have a three megawatt tur turbine or even more, that means a lot of money. Uh, so if a gearbox is failing, you need to order maybe a gearbox. You don't know if that gearbox is in, uh, stored somewhere. It needs to be transported to the turbine. Then a crane needs to be installed. Um, everything needs to be managed. That's like a lot of um, a lot of stuff is happening uh, if a gearbox failure is occurring. And that's the reason why we maybe don't want to concentrate on the failures that happen so often, but we want to concentrate on the failures that that produce the most costs. And in this case, this would be, for instance, the gearbox, the generator, and the drivetrain. Um, so maybe also another thing that one needs to understand is that there's a difference in, uh, in the operation of a turbine between planned maintenance and unplanned maintenance. And so every half a year, technicians need to go onto the turbine and need to um, uh, do some yeah, planned maintenance. And apart from that, every additional time technicians need to go on the turbine, it's additional costs. So you want to reduce these unplanned failures and make them into planned failures. So you want to know if a failure is occurring and maybe the gearbox oil is heating up and or maybe there's not enough gearbox oil uh, in, in, the, in the gearbox that, should, that would be super bad. But you want to prevent this and you want to pre-plan the maintenance uh, with good knowledge from, from uh, data analytics. Another thing that's also interesting right now is that everybody on the market wants to reduce costs. And that also means if you have additional hardware installed like vibration sensors on the, on the gearbox, that means also additional costs. That means that this additional sensors need to be maintained. And um, there's a new data connection. And like you add a lot of 
uh, um, more work if you also add more hardware into the turbine. And um, that's why we uh, try to use the sensors that already exist on the turbines. So just a short overview uh, about turbine systems. Um, we, we also have some hardware where we detect vibrations, but um, we, our main focus is on, on the data analytics of the so-called SCADA data. I will explain what that is later. And um, uh, we do, with that data, we, we do some machine learning. And um, so in the end, you can call that SCADA condition monitoring. Um, a little bit more about the wind turbine data. Um, I think if you are coming maybe from, from another um, domain, for instance, if you have a water power plant, uh, power plant, then then you have maybe um, one plant. It has seven similar turbines inside, and the water is flowing down uh, down, and everything is the same. Uh, high volume project, and um, in in wind energy, this is totally different. Every turbine is different. It is standing on a on a different side. It's standing. It has different components. It has different gearboxes, and um, so you. That's really, really special. So if you have 350,000 turbines in the world, then you also have 350,000 different plants. So um, each and every turbine is gathering um, these uh, supervisory control and data acquisition um, uh, data. And um, theoretically, you can log one second values, even sub-second values. It's kind of a, yeah, you can connect to the brain of the turbine, let's say. And um, standards like new, newer turbines have up, up to 500 plus metrics that can be, for instance, of course, the wind, the power output, but also like uh, the turbulence intensity, um, temperature of the air, um, temperature of the gearbox, pressure of the oil of the gearbox, and so forth, and like many, many values that you can look at. <clears throat> and um, also status logs. Where, where maintenance teams, when they go on the turbine, they log what they did on the turbine. And um, as I said, this theoretically, you can, you can get more data. But the norm is that, especially like wind energy is like quite old, let's say, uh, they started with 10 minute uh, average intervals um, of these data because they didn't know how to handle so much data. Um, yeah, um, as I said already, you have many different data sources. You have many conventions and regulations, especially in Germany, with um, uh, nature protection, um, which is good. But uh, yeah, it, it, it makes things more complicated. <clears throat> you have potentially a lot of data if you want to log everything. You also need to think about, OK, do you physically, does it make sense to log the temperature every millisecond? I think that does make sense. But for instance, if you have motion data of the rotor, there might be actually some information inside that higher quantization of the data. Um, yeah, and then additionally, every turbine is special um, because of the site. If you have a turbine in the middle of a wind park, it is of course differently behaving differently than if it's <clears throat> in, in the front of the wind parks, it um, has less turbulences and um, also the height plays a role because of the, the air pressure. And um, this is the reason why um, if you want to apply machine learning on this kind of data, you really need to think about the physics and you really need to think about, okay, does it make sense to have one model, one machine learning model for, for, for all of the turbines standing everywhere, uh, which is uh, that we believe not the case, but we need to make many machine learning models per turbine and per site. So um, this is why we have this, uh, or this is kind of the structure of our uh, data platform. So we gather uh, weather data, then of course the sensor data of the turbines, everything that we can get, and, and then logs, additional logs maybe from the um, uh, ERP system, like financial data that maybe gives us some, some more insight. We, we collect everything in, in our uh, database uh, and then Apart from that, we um, generate digital twins and um, we offer uh, the 
the solutions or the, the insights in, in different products. Um, for instance, we can offer a, a trained machine learning model of a specific turbine type so that people can understand even better if their turbine is behaving, let's say, as the fleet of that uh, turbine type uh, behaves. So you can compare your own turbine with, a, with other turbines in our database. Then, of course, predictive maintenance. Uh, but also, we can compare um, it within the wind park performances and yeah, many things. Um, and also, of course, we uh, sometimes deliver custom solutions for our uh, customers. So um, this is um, maybe for a wind, uh, wind farmer. This is the, the, the power curve. This is the basic thing that a wind farmer always looks at. Um, you, see, you can see here on the x-axis, you can see the wind speed. And um, on the y-axis, you can see the power in uh, kilowatts and the wind speed is in meters per second. Um, and you can see, for instance, that here the, um, the turbine sometimes stops because maybe grid operators uh, are regulating the turbine down because the grid has too much electricity um, or because of other things, bad control or yeah, load reduction. Um, and then you can see that here after 3.5 meters per second, the turbine starts running. And then it has a, a maximum because the manufacturers didn't build the turbine to uh, to turn around infinitely uh, fast. Um, in uh, blue, you see the real values uh, that the turbine has measured. And in red, you see the predictions that we have learned, or let's say we, we, we have trained a model to learn the behavior of this curve. Um, but actually, one also needs to understand that this, if you would only plot this graph, if, if the physics would be in such a way that, that it, the power only depends on the wind speed, then we maybe wouldn't see such so much of a spread of the data. Um, what happens here is the, the power output is also dependent um, on the pressure of the air, so the energy of the air. And that depends on the temperature, the pressure, um, overall the density, which you can measure with these other parameters. And we use these parameters to train the machine learning model. So actually this graph should be something like a five dimensional graph. And um, we are much better than, than, than just predicting like, like a bint curve here. Um, here you see these predictions in, in, in the time frame. Uh, on the x-axis, you see the time, and on the, on the y-axis, you see the power. In the green, you see the predictions. Um, and here, over that, you see the blue in the real measured data. And in orange, we uh, detected parts where something is behaving weird. And you can see here that in February 11, the turbine has been throttled and because of something that the turbine owner didn't maybe want to happen. And then we give an alarm and we can say, hey, uh, turbine owner, look at your turbine. Something is wrong. You should better um, do something. Um, another example, a very quick example, you see here, uh, again, the power and the, uh, on the y-axis, the pressure of the gearbox oil. You see these many uh, states where the turbine can be in. You can see, see these different uh, behaviors of the turbine. Uh, so the pressure of the gearbox oil, this is a normal behavior. And here the pressure somehow has dropped uh, in, in blue, the real and, and uh, green, the prediction. So something has been wrong here. And actually um, some of the oil uh, cable connections ha ha had, had been broken here. And um, that's why there has been a problem. And of course, you want to know that. Um, yeah, and you want to know that before the turbine is going into some weird status locks, you want to proactively see, OK, the pressure is starting to drop. I need to act now. <clears throat> so why did we use MongoDB originally? Um, it's exactly because of this different data structure. Like, we didn't know in the beginning 
okay, is this the data structure? Maybe we need another column. Maybe we need to lead, delete it. Maybe, yeah, when you want to de develop something on an unknown data source, then I think uh, a non-relational database is a very good choice, uh, especially also if, if the data changes while you are de developing some code, uh, you are very flexible then with MongoDB. But um, if you go into real time, then you come, you get to some some limits or if you want to get into production and get faster and get more and more data you come to some limits and as i said in the beginning um there's a we see a high potential in this one second quantization mean meaning that we have uh, a continuous monitoring of a lot of data uh, maybe even more data points that the turbines are offering right now and um in addition to that, we also want to send data back to the turbines, to the control algorithm of the turbine, to change the, their behavior in real time. For instance, if you have one turbine at the beginning of a wind park and there's a gust coming in, then of course the first turbine realizes, oh, there's a gust, and um, then it can behave according to that gust send the data back to, to Turbit and Turbit is generating a prediction of how the gust would develop into the uh, wind park and tell the other turbines how to uh, turn um, and how to pitch their blades uh, to have an even higher efficiency. Um, if you want to do that, you need to make the step from 144 rows per day to uh, uh, 86,400 uh, rows per day and um, that's about 600 times faster and um, you need for that you need queries that are definitely sub second if you want to go to the second regime you need to calculate stuff uh, in the sub second regime of course and then you also want to add a lot of turbines and a lot of sensor data and a lot of users so um, that kind of gets tricky but um, also when you have a large database, um, how you perform the developing at the moment, um, you, for, especially for debugging, you use, uh, you use a smaller um, part of the database uh, versus if you really want to get um, good debugging, you, you, you can use a lot of data at the same time. So if you're faster with everything, you can maybe uh, uh, debug uh, machine learning algorithms with a larger amount of data um, because everything happens that you couldn't think of in this data so you really need to have real data in order to to debug uh, machine learning code uh, in this uh, domain yeah and of course yeah if everything is faster in production uh, um, that's nice um, also if you have less storage problems with so much data um, and as I said, faster development with faster queries. Um, we ended up sometimes with Mongo, we ended up uh, pre-calculating some queries because they were too slow and then saving them again in the database, uh, which now we don't need to do with Postgres uh, and uh, accelerated by Swarm any longer. And um, that also means, okay, if I want to explore some data uh, very quickly, I can just write the query and I get the data in a, in a nice and fast way. Um, yeah, and the bug I talked already about. Um, and this is uh, maybe just a quick overview about the packages that we're using. So uh, we have both uh, a Mongo and a, a Swarm accelerated uh, Postgres database. Um, for the machine learning stack, we use, uh, yeah, pretty, uh, uh, quite um, uh, simple uh, packages, Python, Django for the, for the framework, for the web interface, Pandas, Numbi, yeah, TensorFlow. And um, in the visual, visualization, uh, Grafana is quite nice because you can then uh, put real-time data into movement on the screen, uh, which is quite nice and uh, plotly is, uh, also a good tool. Um, so yeah, now I would uh, uh, switch to Louis. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, so um, Turbit wanted to 
scale with the number of users, wanted to scale the amount of data, wanted in general a faster database, and uh, to help him solve this, um, see his database issues, it came to Swarm64. And but who is Swarm64? Swarm64, we are a company uh, located in Germany, in Berlin, and we are, we consider ourselves PostgreSQL high performance innovators. We try to make PostgreSQL faster and in an easy way. We are similar to uh, other databases like Oracle, Microsoft, uh, they have units to research on how to improve the performance, especially for analytics. And we consider, ourselves, we consider ourselves the same for the open source PostgreSQL. Uh, why PostgreSQL and why extend PostgreSQL? Because PostgreSQL uh, is, uh, is an amazing open source database. It's one of the most used one, has an amazing, diverse and wide ecosystem. And instead of creating a new database from scratch, we try to, uh, to leverage its, uh, its advantages. Uh, PostgreSQL is mostly focused on high performance for OTP, for transactional workloads. But in Swarm, we are more focused on analytics, on bigger data sets, hundreds, if not terabytes of data. Um, long running queries and so on. So our main product is Swarm 64 DA. DA stands for Data Accelerator. And we are in the version 4.1 uh, that works for PostgreSQL 11.7. And Swarm uses all the uh, extension mechanisms provided by Postgres from hooks, for data wrapper, custom scan providers, uh, custom SQL functions, C backend functions, to offer a greater parallelism, to offer a custom uh, storage engine, to reduce IO consumption, and even optionally to use an FPA as a coprocessor. How Swarm 64DA is makes Postgres faster? Um, as we can see on the left side, Postgres, since Postgres 9.6 and Postgres 10, especially, Postgres is able to parallelize queries. But Postgres is still quite conservative in how much parallelism it introduces in a query. And at some points during a query execution, it can no longer execute the query in parallel, so it has to serialize it. Swarm has a much more aggressive parallelism has uh, reduced IO costs with helps with the parallelism. And not only that, there has custom uh, execution nodes that helps a query plan to be executed in parallel for much longer. So a longer and a deeper uh, um, execution, parallel execution pipeline leads at the end to much faster uh, runtime execution. And as we can see, the CPU can be uploaded uh, to the coprocessor. Uh, Swarm 64DA contains several features, and the core one is on um, optimized storage. And this is a um, hybrid row column format in opposition to the standard uh, row format used by Postgres. And here what I mean is really how the rows, how the data is stored on disk. While Postgres writes complete row one after the other, Swarm splits the attribute, uh, the, basically the columns, and writes some kind of columns together and other columns together. So when you don't need to retrieve all the, the whole row for each query. So the data is vertically partitioned based on the columns, but it's also partition horizontally in bigger chunks than Postgres pages. And on top of that is doing compression. All of this helps to reduce the, to vastly reduce the IO consumption. Uh, this is transactionally safe. And 
up to Postgres 11, we implemented that using the foreign data wrapper um, interface on Postgres. So that means that your queries will not need to be modified and only some small DDL changes basically to create table statement will need to change. On top of that, we have extra uh, our custom range index and some uh, custom clustering. Um, in our development for the front data wrapper, we also, at some point, we needed to create, uh, uh, to support backups because it's not supported by Postgres. Um, sorry, wrong slide. Um, so we also developed a patch and we are contributors uh, to the Postgres uh, to the post community, and we have a new feature coming in Postgres 13. Uh, optionally, part of the computation of the done by the optimized storage can be offloaded to an FPGA, a field programmable gate array coprocessor that will could take care of the compression of the decompression and filtering of rows that will liberate the CPU to execute other parts of the query or execute um, or execute uh, other queries in the system concurrently. But how fast is Postgres in comparison with uh, Swarm 64DA? Uh, here we have a comparison uh, between Swarm, um, Postgres, that is Swarm in Postgres and native Postgres using TPCH. TPCH is a very well-known uh, analytics benchmark that emulates a data a warehouse where orders for items are received, the items are shipped, there is a tracking of the suppliers, and so on. Uh, here we have a test on scale factor 1000, that means approximately one terabyte of data and uh, we execute this uh, benchmark in a DL380. On the left side, we can see what is called a power test, and a power test executes the 22 queries that compose the TPCH benchmark, one after the other, giving all the resources of the machine to the whole query. And here we can see that Swarm64 is 60 times faster than Postgres. <laughs> On the right side, we see uh, the other variant of the benchmark that is in a multi-user environment where four users now, again, in the same system, in the same terabit of data, the four users are issuing the 22 queries um, of the benchmark concurrently. And we can also observe that still even under this, such a high load, uh, Swarm 64 DA is 14 faster, 14 times faster than Postgres SQL. So, going back to the beginning of our story, um, Turbit needed acceleration and scalability. They needed to improve data exploration, how fast can they retrieve the data that they want to see and the, the what data that they want to show to, to the users. They needed faster reporting response time. They don't want the users to wait um, to wait uh, many seconds. <clears throat> they needed new analysis that they could use, for example, for the machine learning, um, for the machine learning algorithms, and for that they will need to execute it in huge amounts of data. If we want to go to the sub-second, we will need to scale and be able to support six hundred time the amount of data that currently the database was receiving. Uh, the turbit is expected to grow in number of clients, which means growing in number of turbines. And of course, they wanted to accelerate the data retrieval for the machine learning algorithms. So we agreed to, so turbit came in February this year, and we developed it, um, a multi-stage uh, plan project to help them tackle these issues. And 
the first ones have already been moved into production. Here we can see the current architecture of Turbit Web Report. So Turbit Web Report initially was only using MongoDB and to slowly enable Turbit Web Report to migrate its functionalities to Postgres uh, as they see necessary, we set up a second database using Postgres and Swarm with Postgres where all the data from Mongo and Mongo is still here, the main, the, the master copy of all the data, but all the data from Mongo is continuously streamed into Postgres. So Postgres and Swarm contain a complete copy of the data. And we are already offering several services to the Turbit Web Report using only Swarm data. Services that would not be possible to offer if the data was querying MongoDB, at least not without extra engineering effort, as Michael described. Um, we have a better uh, reporting with Grafana, and we have two custom analyses. But how is the database, how is Postgres and Swarm set up here? Well, we have to remember that here we are mostly uh, seeing time series data, so the temporal component is the main driver for all the queries, all the analysis. We have a custom mode, the, a custom module that replicates each change on the Mongo database into Postgres. So we are always up to date. And the main design in the Postgres and Swarm is very simple one. It's basically a single wine table where all the MongoDB data is available as a JSON column and any other key attributes from the JSON data or from the MongoDB that is already necessary for the for high performance queries done by Grafana or other analysis has been already flattened into individual columns. Um, this uh, huge table it's also horizontal partitioning and individual turbines because mostly each turbine is going to be query along or we are going to see aggregations between turbines. But, the, but here we have already, uh, so the horizontal partitioning has already, it's a, already a query optimization mechanism. It's going to save a lot of IO. On top of that, each partition is going to be as we saw, it's going to be a store using the hybrid row column storage format from Swarm that is going to execute extra horizontal and vertical partitioning. So really queries that require to retrieve only days or only a month is going to retrieve from this exactly the amount of data that they need. As we see, the compression here plays also a huge factor. And we are speaking at the moment, we have around one terabyte of data in Turbit. This data in Swarm, thanks to the compression, takes uh, 12 times less. Thanks to Swarm 64 DA, Turbit has now a couple of extra analysis that they can offer to their clients Directly to their clients or to their own internal algorithms. One is gap analysis. As we saw, um, the turbines emit um, 10 minute aggregates of data, but sometimes they fail to report this data. Uh, that could be because of network issues, malfunctions in another place, and so on. So um, we have an algorithm that explores these time series and finds gaps for each turbine where no data is present. This can be used by Turbit clients to maybe retry and try to recover the, this missing data. It can, be, it can be used for as an input for the machine learning modeling it can be used to identify which turbines are less reliable in the sense that they provide less information or uh, 
we can use the gap analysis to interpolate and, and generate the missing gaps so we can use other kind of algorithms that require a very constant uh, time, time step. Another analysis is also a downtime, downtime analysis. It's a multidimensional static analysis to identify or help identify the root cause of why a turbine is not generating enough power because we can get that the turbine is working but is generating a much less power than expected. It could be because of unexpected maintenance. It could be because of a monk function or uh, any other cause. But if we are able to already in the two bit web report to tag this thing, uh, to tag this, this root cause, uh, that uh, makes more clear to the wind farmer what is going on. The third point that uh, Swarm was offering was, was faster turbine data exploration, in this case using Grafana. We have seen already uh, uh, with Michael how the exploration or how, the <clears throat> how it looks like the power output versus time from a turbine. Now, if we have a lot of users accessing the Turbit web report and querying for data, uh, we will want to have fast response times and keep the, the user experience very low. Also, similarly, the same queries uh, that we will need to feed into the machine learning uh, control feedback back to the wind turbines um, need to be under a second. So in this graph, we can see on the horizontal axis an, uh, a comparison where, uh, where an increasing number of clients is accessing the to report that is they are doing queries that retrieve data and make computations on the database. And in the vertical axis, we, take, we see how many seconds. The red dots is the time needed by Swarm64 DA to return the expected output, while the gray dots are the same for MongoDB. And the yellow line, yellow strip line, is the average for MongoDB, while the black line is the average for Swarm64 DA. And <clears throat> we see that Swarm64 scales much better, has a, is much flatter than MongoDB, is able to be in sub-second with the current amount of data. Uh, with, so it's, it's able to serve 5.5 more users than MongoDB, uh, which MongoDB basically with three, four users already starts to suffer. Um, so the behavior of Swarm, it's much faster. Not only faster, it's much more stable. We see that the variability on MongoDB runtime is much higher than in Swarm. This behavior is not only visible in, in Turbit. Uh, we had a previous project with Toyota about connected cards using post JAS to locate uh, vehicles, yeah, to look geographically locate them. And here we can see a similar analysis. Here, the number of threads is basically the number of users, the number of queries being done in concurrently. In orange, we see the uh, response time for Swarm City for the A here. But here in, bl in blue, we don't have MongoDB, we have PostgreSQL without Swarm. And we can see that also against Postgres, Swarm is, again, much faster and much more stable and with less viability. This enables to, uh, you need le to scale out less, that is things that you will need a cluster to serve. Now you can do it in a single uh, server, is what we call scaling. So 
here we have seen what has Swarm 64DA done for Turbit. But can Swarm 64DA help in your particular case? Well, here we have, of course, several things to consider. Uh, Swarm 64DA uh, is mostly planned or thought to be used for analytics, where we speak about hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes of data, big queries, queries that needs to go across, uh, uh, to need to prune a lot of data. Uh, we need queries that they need to be able to be parallel, parallelizable. Um, in Postgres, depending on if you use too many functions, if you use uh, PL SQL, uh, PLPT SQL, you might find that your queries are not parallelizable. Swan 64 increases the parallelism, but adding more parallelism to something that cannot be parallelizable is pointless. Um, and Swan 64 DL helps also in situations where you have high concurrency. So here being honest, if no, if your workload does not match at least one of these cases, it is very unlikely that Swarm 64DA is going to help you. So Swarm 64DA again builds on Postgres, it's not a fork, it's uh, not a new database, it's a plugin, it's an extension, it builds on top of Postgres. So most of the ecosystem, if not all the ecosystem of Postgres is compatible uh, with Swarm 64DA. In Swarm 64DA we have a very simple, very affordable uh, pricing. It's $33 per virtual core per month. Uh, currently, Swan 64DA is delivered with Postgres 11, 11.7. As we have said, it can be also combined with Enterprise DB EPAS. Uh, can run on premise, can run on cloud. We are also immediately available in AWS. And you have, in case of to opt in for the coprocessor path, you have also several uh, alternatives to our partners. Finally, if you think that Strong 64DA could help you, or maybe even if you doubt it, uh, there is several ways to try Swarm. Uh, you can contact us, you can get a trial license, a lab license, and you can try Strong 64DA in your own data center or even easier, you can go it to the cloud. We have a seven days free trial, free trial uh, where you can have a, a Swarm 64 DA server up and running in less than five minutes. Just You just need to visit the Swarm 64 uh, website and you will find all the information. And with this, uh, thank you very much to everyone for coming in and attending and we are glad to answer any of your questions. Thank you, <clears throat> Luis. Thank you, Michael. Uh, there was one question that came in that was, um, I think, from Michael, and that is, what do you do uh, when you see gaps in the data? Yeah, so um, turbine data can, can be a little bit messy sometimes. So. One needs to understand that um, if the turbine, uh, if the grid operator says, for instance, um, that there's too much electricity in the in the grid and we need to reduce the, the, the amount of power in the grid, then what they do is they can switch off the turbine. That really means they switch it off. There's no electricity on the turbine. It's completely still. There's no electricity there. and in the meantime, also the manufacturers didn't have a solution to have a battery or something to at least measure the wind speed. No, they don't measure that. It's completely switched off. There's no light in the turbine, not working. And of course, during that time, you have no data. So um, if you want to do time series analysis, you have a problem. You you want to you want to fill um, these data gaps, and you need to come up with some solutions. Uh, whether to use the data around that event or not. And uh, that's that's quite an issue. So you need to first identify these uh, data gaps uh, and then, yeah, make, make sure uh, to find a solution what you can do with that. 
and um, yeah, that's uh, pretty nice. Uh, with with the swarm, we were developing uh, some algorithms for that to to handle this situation. Thank you. Okay, we're at the top of the hour now. So um, actually, one uh, other question is. There a um, white paper on the architecture of Swarm 64DA to understand how it works. Uh, the answer is yes. We can send everybody a link to that afterwards, and that that explains you know um, where Swarm, what use cases Swarm accelerates, and what use cases it does not accelerate. As uh, Luis already mentioned, you know it's it's really focused on uh, speeding up analytic type of workloads, uh, query intensive and especially queries that, um, you know, if you have queries that uh, seem to respond uh, well to parallelism in Postgres, they're gonna speed up even more with uh, Postgres, which makes all the parallelism better. Another question that came in is, what additional benefit do people receive when they run form with an FPGA coprocessor? I think as uh, Luis mentioned, um, it, it just, if there's an FPGA present on the server, we install an, uh, an FPGA image that uses the FPGA's uh, processing to uh, add even more parallel processing, about 100 plus uh, SQL reader and writer processes that uh, speed things up further. And generally speaking, it's, a, um, it's around a 2x increase in performance uh, on the uh, server. So it's actually quite a good, uh, it's a good way to speed things up. Uh, I think that's, that's it for now. We're at the top of the hour. So we have a few more here, but we'll follow up with those uh, via email. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank all of you for um, joining us today. Luis, Michael, Andy, thank you for... Does people get when they, do people receive when they run uh, swarm with an FPGA coprocessor. Uh, I think, as uh, Luis mentioned, um, it, it just if there's an FPGA present on the server, we uh, install an, uh, an FPGA image that uses the FPGA's uh, processing to uh, add even more parallel processing, uh, about 100 plus uh, SQL reader and writer processes that uh, speed things up further. And generally speaking, it's a um, it's around a two x uh, increase in just performance uh, on the uh, server. So it's actually quite a good from a price performance perspective. Okay, it's a Are good there way. any further questions, Andy? Uh, it's a good way to speed things up. Uh, I think that's that's it for now. We're at the top of the hour, so we have a few more here, but we'll follow up with those um, uh, via email. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank all of you for um, joining us today. Luis, Michael, Andy, thank you for being on and presenting. And I hope to see all of you on the next Postgres conference uh, webinar. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay.